Would you consider yourself a small scale farmer? I believe so, I believe so. A lot of young people definitely they're hmm. not looking at farming as a viable uh, career path. Exactly. Uh, I think it's mainly because you know of the startup capital needed in order to do a successful farming venture. So at the end of the day, the market is there. Yes, the market is there. Because other people, when they are looking at starting something like this, mm -hmm. they avoid to start because they think that the market is not there. Do you think that a lot of people in Zimbabwe or Africa in general are sleeping on this type of farming? Ah, definitely, I think so. <laughs> definitely, I think so. Uh, one of the most difficult things for me or the biggest challenges was to actually get acceptance ah, in the market. Yeah. And, you know, because, you know, when you're starting something and you're small, you've got one greenhouse or two greenhouses and you're also young, not many people take you seriously per se or afford you uh, opportunities that maybe someone of a, uh, an older age or someone with more money would be afforded. So I think just getting into the markets and getting acceptance and mm. getting knowledge took long for, for me and it took a lot of time. So I think for most of the youth, I think that's the biggest challenge that they'll face. Uh, to have someone or some organizations who will actually uplift the youth and assist them with knowledge and point them in the right direction and also just help them get you know market recognition quickly so that they can sell their produce to the market. As a Zimbabwean, actually as an African, when I see leaves like this, I'm thinking of eating them. <laughs> Are they eatable? Uh, no, unfortunately they're not. But you're not the first person to say that. Everyone who comes in here yeah. thinks they are, you know, veggies that you can cook. They look nice. <laughs> yeah, they definitely do. But uh, no, you can't eat them. They're, for, they're just uh, for the cucumbers. I'll have to go back a little bit. Yeah. But uh, after my university, I came back to Zimbabwe. And then I came across greenhouse farming by So you by did chance. your university outside? the country yes i did my university in china actually in china yes and i came back in 2018 ah i was mm. there for around seven years seven years yes i did my university and then i taught english for about three years uh while i was there and then after that i decided let me then come back have you ever thought of finding a job there uh, I did actually while well, I was teaching English in China, ah. that's the job that I was doing, I was teaching at university, but I also thought about finding a job there, but you know what, I don't know what it was, but I just always had this feeling of coming back uh, home oh. and starting something of my own. When <clears throat> you were thinking of coming back to Zimbabwe, did you think that I'm actually going to go home and start farming? Uh, not at all, it's actually a very funny thing because mm. uh, I'm sure I've spoken about this <laughs> quite a lot of times, but then I had never done farming in my life and uh, farming was not something that I would have you know, seen myself ever doing in a million years. But I think maybe it's just you know, by chance uh, yes. or by exposure that I came across farming uh, during that period while I was still looking for a job. And then you know, once I saw it and once I saw the greenhouses and how everything is, I kind of fell in love and then I took it from there. Where exactly did you get the inspiration to actually focus on this type of farming? Uh, okay, so like I said, when I came, I came across hydro, I came across greenhouse farming. Okay. So when I started, I was doing greenhouse farming in my parents' backyard, but it was actually in the ground. Oh, okay. And then from online, I came across hydroponics and then I met uh, uh, a lady who then became my uh, my mentor. Oh, okay. uh, her name is Miss Mukarati, and she's the one who was doing hydroponic farming. And then she showed me and allowed me to come for training there. And once I went for training, I just fell in love immediately. Wow. And then I worked on converting my operation to a full hydroponic operation. How is it so far? So far it's good. Uh, we've been operating since 2019. Okay. So okay. that's about five years now, I believe. So I think it's okay. Obviously, there's always ups and downs in business uh, in farming yes. as any venture. But then for us right now, I think we are in a good place where we finally figured out our model and you know the type of crops, the market. So we are now looking at actually scaling this whole operation uh, to a more commercial operation. Really? Yes. So let's look at where we are right now. You focus on what type of plant here? 
Uh, so here on this site, right, this yes. is uh, our primary site. We call it site one, right? Okay. Uh, so over here, as you can see, we've got quite a lot of lettuce. Exactly. Lettuce is our primary crop, I would say. Uh, on this site, we are on 1,150 uh, square meters, and we have 10,110 heads of lettuce. Uh, so so it is profitable? Lettuce. It is profitable. Uh, I mean, with hydroponics, one of the main benefits is that you save space. Yes, uh, yes so noticed. for example 10,000 crops that we have 10,100 crops mm. uh, we are farming them on a thousand one hundred square meters but in conventional soil based farming you would need between four to five times the amount of space that we are using here you said that the Zimbabwean weather conditions are very conducive for farming yes from your own perspective do you think that farming is the backbone of Africa's economy I mean definitely it's I think it's always been uh, yeah. the backbone. I know there's things like mining now yeah. Yeah. Um, and different things, but farming has always been the backbone of Africa. Yeah. And I think over the years, with emerging markets, like I said, with mining, things yeah. like that, we are sort of uh, moving away from our, you know, our, our roots, so yeah. to say. Mm. So, I mean, with, you know, all this training and exposure, we do definitely hope to bring more people back into farming. I mean, all sectors need to be working in a country in order for the country to be successful or a continent. So I believe that we shouldn't just leave farming and say yes. it's something of, you know, the, the olden days. Now let's move on to something else. But we should also just make sure we invest sufficiently in knowledge and uh, technology in farming so that farming remains, you know, what it's supposed to be or one of the backbones of you know Africa. I'm happy to see people like you doing farming as young as you are. People who have that basic mentality, I would say negative basic mentality that farming is for old people. I've noticed that the same plants that are outside are the same plants that are inside. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, okay so these systems are uh, I call them grow beds. Okay. Uh, this is an experimental design that we've been doing for the past eight months. All right. uh, the whole idea of hydroponics as you mentioned is hydroponics is very capital intensive. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why it's so capital intensive is you need a greenhouse right yeah. by conventional methods everyone says you need a greenhouse yeah. and the greenhouse is not you know it's not cheap yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it's quite not, expensive it's so you need to if you want to invest in this you need to get a greenhouse and then you also need to get the system inside the pumps everything mm. so that then makes it very you know expensive uh to set up so i thought to myself uh why not try build something and put it outside because you know with such methods like this mainly they're they're mainly used in the western countries yes. you know so the weather there is very you know it's very different it's not very conducive for farming, which is why they really need a lot of greenhouses, you know, to make sure that the plants are warm enough and don't freeze. Mm. But here in Zimbabwe, our weather is actually quite good and very conducive for farming. So I thought to myself, how oh, about we try out, you know, out here in the open, as you can see, and see if we can actually lower the cost of hydroponics by removing the greenhouse uh, cost and actually having the system cost. So this is why we've done this. So over the last eight months, we've been doing tests and results, as you can see. Yeah, it's good. They actually, it actually seems to be working, yeah. which is great for us. So the idea with these outside grow beds is yes. that you then don't need a greenhouse. You just get one bed or two bed or three beds, depending on the size of your space. And then it will be cheaper for you. And then with that, uh, we hope to encourage more and more people to start taking up hydroponic farming. I want to talk about the market. Uh, market is one of the biggest things that people overlook yeah. when you're, you know, when you're doing farming or if you're actually selling any product. But exactly. for us, when we started, uh, our main focus was always restaurants, hotels, ah. uh, right? So with restaurants and hotels, there is a benefit uh, in that. So there's a benefit and a disadvantage. So the benefit is that if you have a contract, a supplier's contract with a restaurant, yeah. you are like, well, you're going to supply them throughout the year, whether it's winter, whether it's summer. So yeah. you now have constant uh, offtake for your produce, which is great. Also recently, we've started uh, also expanding ah. to supermarkets. Uh, so we're doing quite a lot of supermarkets now. So that's also just great as so well. When you started, were you sure that the market is there or you took a risk of saying, let me just try? The idea was that, you know, uh, it wasn't an area that, you know, I was well versed in. Uh, but then I could see 
some of the things wrong or some of the things that were not going right. So I actually could see some of the gaps even from the beginning. Because I mean, if you go to the supermarket right now and you say you're looking for some parsley or some basil, mm. most probably you're not going to find it. Exactly. Or if you find it, it's not going to be of the highest quality, mm. right? Mm. Uh, in most shops, I mean, there are some shops, but uh, in most shops, you are not going to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you go, you're looking for a head of lettuce and you see it's you know, <laughs> it's covered in snails or yeah, you know, exactly. something like that, or they don't actually have, or it looks like it was harvested last, you yeah. know, last week. Yeah. So, I mean, those are some of the things that we used or that I used when I was starting to say, okay, fine, uh, we want to penetrate the market and we want to make sure that we always have consistent, affordable and flavorful uh, produce at all times because we were seeing that the market is failing to achieve that consistently. So... It was a bit of a risk, but mm. it was a bit of an informed risk, I would say, uh, okay. when we started. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people, farmers, and most of them, their their farming is capital intensive and mm. some mm. it's not. Okay. Is it true that when I venture into a type of farming that is capital intensive, the returns are good? So, uh, I think, you know what... Uh, mm. It's not automatically that it's going to be like that, yeah. right? Uh, some ventures are very capital intensive, but they give you low returns, yeah. right? But with something like this, uh, I think we just need to look at the benefits of the actual, you know, farming uh, uh, technique. So basically with hydroponic farming, uh, the it's very capital intensive, definitely, mm. but the running costs are cheaper than in the ground. Ah. I mean, just look at this, like yeah. I mentioned, we save water, we save yes. up to 90% of water. Mm -hmm. uh, many people don't realize it, but water or irrigation is actually a very big overhead in farming. Yes. Uh, also, electricity, we are completely off-grid. As you can see, uh, we use solar systems, yeah. Yeah. Uh, inverters and stuff. And then on labor. So just to give you context, this greenhouse, this is a 66 square meter greenhouse, right? In here, we've got 2,732 heads of lettuce, but they're only manned by one person, ah. right? Uh, how do we achieve that? It's because we don't have any dirt. We don't have any yeah. weeds. Yeah. We don't have any, you know, fertilizer application where you come hold to exactly, hold. Exactly. So that means on average, we can have, you know, way less. So you would see that you know, as you go, it's actually cheaper. It's a cheaper method of farming. It's just the start that requires a lot of capital. You have been doing horticulture for some time now. <laughs> what plant is it difficult to deal with? To deal with? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, plants that are difficult to deal with. But from my experience, I think things like tomatoes are very hard to grow. Mm. You know, there's always, uh, I mean, everyone likes to grow tomatoes. Yeah. But there's always pests that are, you know, some pests uh, that are always attacking some <laughs> diseases. So I think tomatoes are the hardest. I mean, you can grow them, but to get them of good quality, shape and size yeah. is actually very hard and requires a lot of work in my experience. As of now, what plant is on demand? Uh, so, I mean, for us, right, how our model is, is that we have our plants that we grow and we have our contracts with our uh, <coughs> customers, right? Yeah. So we don't really look at what's in demand mm. because we have a constant supply, as I mentioned. So, I mean, lettuce, for example, cucumbers, we do microgreens, we've got sprouts, we've got herbs, mm. uh, edible flowers. So all those products, uh, product lines, they're always in demand for us because they're always needed in the places that we supply. Hi, this is Eddie Customs Clearing and Forwarding. Eddie Customs Clearing and Forwarding is a leading importer of motor vehicles, farming equipment from countries like South Africa, Thailand, and Japan. Their services include vehicle procurement processing, customs clearance at all borders and airports. We import uh, farming equipment, mining equipment, motor vehicles, even spares. Have you ever failed in, in this venture of yours farming definitely definitely uh again yeah. you know because we've been doing this for so long uh now you know in retrospect as you look back at things you start to see a lot of failures that you did yeah and you start to appreciate them but when i started i used to fail a lot i mean we still fail here and there this is farming yeah. farming is there's no you know silver bullet where you say look now we are at a stage where we don't have any crop losses etc it's still nature but we failed a lot, especially when we started with hydroponics, especially 
uh, in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, getting markets, getting consistent markets, and you know when you're starting, uh, it's very hard to get the right type of markets that you're looking for because you don't have a name for yourself ah, and yeah. also consistency in produce at the beginning was very tough for us where you know one month we have crops everything's good the next month we have a crop failure and we don't have so definitely we had a lot of failing along the way but we believe that it's also just uh you know obviously made us grow into who we are today and it's going to help us you know going forward in the future so this type of business from your own perspective it's lucrative uh yes i would say so it definitely is lucrative uh, which is why we've you know stayed with it for so long uh, i would believe it is definitely if done correctly if done correctly yes obviously. if i'm looking at the space it's small mm -hmm. and in this area only you're doing cucumbers would i actually get good money after selling these cucumbers from this small space Okay, so this greenhouse is 120 square meter greenhouse. That's okay. an 8 by 15 meter uh, space. Mm. Uh, and like I said, we've got 380 plants here. Yeah. So on average, every week, you can expect around 350 to 360 uh, mm. uh, heads of cucumbers every week. So just depending on your market, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but just with anything, farming is a game of scale. Exactly. So yes, you can make a little bit of something with one greenhouse, but definitely in order for you to be, you know, lucrative and cover your overheads you need more than one grow house in order you know to get enough money for that so if how much is one cucumber so depending on the market again uh, and where you're selling it but yeah. you can sell it anyway from uh, 60 cents to a dollar depending on your market i think there's some misconception out there where people think if you have you know 100 hectares or 50 hectares yeah yeah then just gonna be profitable but i'm sure as you know uh, from going around that you can actually have a very big space yeah but actually not be profitable or be making a loss so i think for me i think mainly it's an uh, it's an issue of education right where the youth in zimbabwe uh we see farming as an old person's game so to say ah. so <laughs> we don't really do our research and we don't really have a lot of role models uh, that yes. we can you know model ourselves uh, on which is why here at vita grow uh, we really put an emphasis on the youth and also training the youth mm. to show that look not everyone has 100 hectares or not everyone has 50 hectares right mm. but you can have a small space but with methods like hydroponics you can actually you know do something or have a project or a business that can be sustainable for you and look after you and your family so th we hope by all this training and exposure we're actually inspiring uh, a lot of the youth out mm -hmm. there to start venturing into farming i think there's always a misconception when people find out about hydroponics yeah. because they're thinking okay hydroponics why do we need you know to get all these pumps all this exactly. machinery when there's so much land especially in africa and zimbabwe there's so much land available yeah uh but hydroponics is not there to replace uh conventional farming mm. it's just a different method of farming right oh, wow. as you can see we focus mainly on horticulture right so for things like wheat and maize and stuff it's fine uh it should right now it's best suited in the soil in mm. the ground in conventional ways but for horticultural things especially urban farming mm. uh, in the urban areas there's not a lot of you know land or farming so i do definitely believe that people are not taking full advantage of you know the benefits and the opportunities that uh, methods of farming like hydroponics uh, offer. But is there going to come a time that you actually use your degree or as of now it's just a contingency plan? <laughs> so for me uh, again my degree is in finance mm. right so I guess I do kind of use it yeah, uh, in my yeah, venture I, I've noticed. Uh, but then in terms of actually going back and leaving some you know working uh, leaving my mm. business mm. and going to work for someone else I don't believe so. I mean, it's always good to have something on the side, but I mean, I'm quite invested in this and I'm quite confident in what we are doing here to say that for, you know, for my future, this is where I'm going to be. It seems like when someone starts their own business, even if it fails in the future, for them to actually go and work for someone else, it's difficult. Why? It's very difficult, you know, there's a, you know, I always tell people, you know, when you, there's this uh, there's this other misconception that you know when you start a business or when you run your own business yeah. it's very easy. 
yeah. just making money you've got people working for you you yeah. know and uh but i always tell them that you actually work harder on your own business than if you're working for someone because there's no working hours there's no you know even after five o'clock six o'clock seven o'clock i'm there i'm working on my laptop crunching numbers or trying to fix uh issues uh but at the end of the day i think there's something very satisfying about you know working mm. you know for yourself or working on something that is your that is yours and that can actually be passed down from generation to generation so there's this level of satisfaction that i believe i believe personally you don't get from you know the conventional working uh, versus actually having something of your own